Um, so now we've got the single <coughs> dose coming. We've got new news that the vaccination is better than we thought. Things are looking good. Except for that we're approaching in the United States <coughs> another milestone, which is, uh, let's look at that, <coughs> half a million. <coughs> Now, the number of deaths from the regular flu is reported to be around 10% of that. So, is there any person who says this is just the flu now that it has killed, allegedly, and I don't, I don't believe the number of deaths from the regular flu, but it's reported, it's in that you know, 50,000 range, I think 80,000, let's say 50,000. If we hit half a million on the coronavirus, Oh. It is ten times as deadly. Is there anybody left who still thinks oh. ten times as deadly? Oh. I know some of you are saying, I'm counting it wrong. It's not really half a million, it's a smaller number. Even if it's a smaller number, it's three times as deadly or something. Uh, yeah, some people say I don't believe the number of deaths. Well, let's get to that. Speaking of, So CNN has decided to go full racist and see if see if this is too strong. <coughs> so I'm making the claim right now that CNN's coverage last night was fully, transparently, obviously just racist. Like <coughs> seriously racist. Like as racist as you can be. I'm not talking about the the woke kind of racist, you know, where you're somebody offended somebody, but you're not sure there was any racial, racist intent, or even maybe racist outcome of any serious guy. I'm not talking about the woke stuff. I'm talking about the real, like, classic, worst the stuff you can have kind of racism. Now, I'm going to describe what they did, and then you tell me if I'm <coughs> over-interpreting it. Have I gone too far? Is this hyperbole? I'll tell you what they did. So the reporting is that there are a number of uh, state laws being created to restrict voting, um, restrict voting in a variety of ways, such as limiting drop boxes, eliminating Sunday voting, requiring uh, IDs for mail-in voting, etc. So, so things along those lines. Now, every one of these. Yeah. Of decreasing the number of people who could. Because uh, every time you put any friction on something, what uh, happens to everybody? Have you ever listened to me talk about friction? Uh, when you add friction, less of something happens. That's how friction works. When uh, you remove friction or reward something, you get more of it. So wouldn't you expect that if they restrict voting, you're uh, less of voting? That doesn't sound good, right? Even though what they're trying to stop is the illegal voting. But you would probably go beyond that. You, there's no doubt about it. There's nobody here who's an adult who <clears throat> doubts the fact that these things would, re would decrease the number of black voters. <clears throat> anybody would doubt that. Does anybody think that it wouldn't decrease the number of black voters? Because it would decrease, wait for it, all voters. <laughs> it, would, it would decrease all voters. Now let me ask you this. The, in Georgia, one of Georgia's one of the states that's being uh, looked at for doing exactly this kind of stuff. I don't know the demographics, but wouldn't it be true that there are more <coughs> poor white people still? than for black people. Check, check my work on this, because I'm not positive that when I get to my ultimate point that I haven't missed something, okay? So I'm going to give you this statement with a 65% level confidence on my side. It goes like this. If you do something to add friction, and it's the kind of friction that uh, will grind up on the low end of the economic so I would say that every one of these voting restrictions would hit hardest at people who are on the low end of the economic uh, ladder. You'd agree with that, right? Pretty much any.
any kind of friction on the on voting is you know it's going to hit the low economic group harder. They may not be able to take the day off to vote unless they get Sunday. They may not be able to drive. Might not even have a car. So if you can, you know, it might not even have bus fare. So if you can drop off a, a, your ballot at the drop box, <clears throat> more likely to do it. Requiring ID if you're low low economic situation, maybe you're less likely to have ID. So the things we can agree on so far is that poor people would be hit the hardest with any restrictions. At least <coughs> everything we're talking about is poor people the hardest. Number two, <coughs> fewer black people would be expected to vote <coughs> because among the category of poor people we have a number of black people. And percentage-wise, I think this is still true, right? Percentage-wise, the percentage of black people in the bad economic situation would be a higher percentage than, say, white people. So far, that's all true, right? Is there anything that's not true yet? Well, here's the part I'm talking about. You don't vote for president with a percentage. You don't say, hey, somebody want a percentage of the black vote so they can be president. You still have to win the most number of votes, right? You don't get to be president unless you get the most number of votes. It's a quantity thing. It's not a percentage thing. So aren't there way more poor white people everywhere? Or is that different, say, in some Georgia's uh, cities, for example, where maybe it's, a, it's important to the electoral college process? So the question I'm asking is that somebody's pointing out the electoral college, right? So there might be some places, such as some cities, cities, in which you would exactly have the impact of the more poor black people there, quantity-wise as well as percentage, and therefore maybe that could change the vote. But basically, CNN is making the case that anything that affects poor people's uh, voting will affect black people more. That's racist. <sighs> That's like pure racism. That's not even a little bit not racist. There's not even an argument against it, is there? Is there any argument on the other side? I don't even know what the counter argument is. I'm not even saying the counter argument is right or wrong. I don't think there is one. If you're saying that poor black people have less capability, this is what CNN is saying, effectively <coughs> saying this, this, that a poor black person would have less capability <coughs> to solve how to vote than a poor white person. <coughs> That's what they're saying. And <coughs> By saying that it's racist to make these changes, you are saying now poor white people have this extra capability. If you don't know how to vote on a Sunday or to get an ID, I don't know if there's any date that backs that up, is there? But, and again, I will accept that as a percentage, it would be a bigger percentage uh, on the black population, but we don't elect presidents based on percentage. <coughs> You still have to get the most number of votes. And if there are more poor white people, isn't it affecting that more than the smaller group of poor black people? I, I'm really uncomfortable with this idea that, well, I don't have to say more about it. I think I find it uncomfortably racist, the way they talk about it. But the point of it, I have a complete agreement with it, by the way. Philosophically, and in terms of what is good and bad, of course, you don't want to disadvantage one group over another. So, of course, you don't want new rules that will you know, disenfranchise any group, if you can do it. All right, um, and look at some of these rules. Calling early voting tests. So, basically, the activity of getting rid of uh, voters that you know should not be registered for you know, real reasons. How in the world is that racist? It's racist to talk about it as racist, but it's not racist to have an accurate count of who can vote. I mean, this is crazy. All right. Let's talk about uh, how to determine fake news. I tweeted around this morning that apparently Finland is 
teaching children as young as six how to spot fake news. So Finland has decided that a national priority is teaching children to spot fake news. How, how cool is that? Can you imagine anything that would be really more useful than that? To teach a child? That's just about the most useful, smartest thing I've heard in a long time. Right? I can't think of anything that would be more useful as a, an educational concept. Now, obviously, you need to read, write, do that. But in terms of beyond that, <clears throat> teaching people to spot bullshit, that's really important. Well, at the same time, in a weird coincidence, there's an article in the New York Times same same day that I see this Finland story, the New York Times has a story about a, uh, a digital literacy expert at a Washington State University in Vancouver, Mr. Caulfield. And he's developed a four-point uh, process for, for figuring out if news is fake. And I'll tell you his method, and then we'll compare it to mine in a moment. So the four steps of this. Number one, so you read a story, and you want to know if it's true or fake news. The first thing you do is slow down, to think about, right? You don't want to stop. Don't just read it and move on. Right? The first thing you do is stop. Two, investigate the story. Who exactly is saying this? Right? Number three, find it better covered. In other words, find a new source which you trust more. Oh. It just fell apart, didn't it? <laughs> so it's oh. a four-point process. I haven't even got to the fourth point, and you know the process. Because the third point is find better coverage. that capability, you would not be fooled by fake news in the first place. You don't know what is the better coverage, do you? Is it CNN? Is it MSNBC? Is that your better coverage? Is it? Or is it Fox News? Is it Breitbart? So by the third of those four points, it completely falls apart. It couldn't possibly work in the real world because we don't know what the better coverage is. Oh. The fake news fools us about what the better coverage. We can't tell. Now, I feel like I can tell, and so do you, don't you? You feel like you can tell. That you think you can tell. But that's the problem. Some of you are right, some of you can tell. But can the average person oh. You think the average news consumer who's more of a casual oh. news consumer, if you're watching this live stream, oh. I mean, uh, I don't know, top 5% of oh. pay attention to news, otherwise you wouldn't be. Oh. Uh, but the general country, they're not paying attention oh. that much. They can't tell which are good sources of news. Oh. That's not something they'll ever be able to do if they're casually consuming. Oh. Uh, but then the fourth one is trace the claims, quotes, and media to the <coughs> context. So this is good. So the fine people, <coughs> for example, if you had traced it to the original context, played the original <coughs> video, you would have known it was okay. <coughs> But who in the world is going to do this? You know, open up your, your home page. There are, let's say, on Fox News or CNN, maybe five stories, and all of them are reasonably important, you know, to the, to the world. Are you going to fact check on your own, you know, go look for other sources and stuff for 25 stories a day? No, no you're not. There's no human way you're going to do this work. But there is one uh, interesting uh, tidbit. So I'm going to ignore the, the four steps. I don't think they're well devised to actually work. 
<laughs> but he does say one thing that's good. Don't do a deep dive on something that you're not sure is true. Because by the time you're done, you'll think it was true. So if you go, if you watch a video that's, say, an hour or two long, and it's like this whole conspiracy theory, if you, t if you make the mistake of watching the whole two hours, and you don't go check anything else to see if it's right or wrong, you will be brainwashed. Because that two hours is going to be good. It's going to be really convincing without any counterpoints. So anything that you go into a deep well, you basically <coughs> brainwashing yourself. That's <coughs> QAnon. You know, QAnon is sort of deep, uh, deep well. You spend a lot of time with <coughs> conspiracies and things you yourself into. <coughs> so he's, Mr. Caulfield is recommending <coughs> instead that instead of doing a <coughs> deep dive and, and basically keeping <coughs> yourself on a topic, you <coughs> do a, uh, a, let's say, a shallow dive, and then you <coughs> take it sideways. Meaning that you check what other people are saying at the same time. So that it would be better to spend five seconds seeing what CNN says and five seconds seeing what somebody else says than it would be to spend two hours looking at what one person says. And that is math I agree on. That's where we're completely bad. In my book, Loser Think, Loser Think, which would be the book I would give to everybody in Finland who's trying to learn how to determine what is fake news. In fact, it's the best, probably the best book on, in the world on <sighs> fake news. And I have one uh, tip in there that I think is better than these four steps and better than what every Finland is teaching their kids. It goes like this. In this country, anyway, I'm not sure it would work everywhere, but in this country, where we have such a siloed uh, news from the left, we have a siloed news from the right, use the following rule. If both of them report the news the same, it's probably true. So if they say uh, there are freezing temperatures in Texas and the power is out, and they both say that, it's probably true. But if one network <sighs> says that the president once called neo-Nazis fine people, and you can find another major outlet that says it didn't happen, and here's why. Which one do you trust? The one that says it did happen, or the one that says it did not happen? Always go with did not. And it doesn't matter who said what. That's the key point. Doesn't matter if the left says it's true or the right says it's true. If the other one, and it doesn't matter which of the outlets, if there's a major outlet, says it's not true, and then shows their work, uh, and show their work, it's not true. And if you uh, follow that rule, you'll be right at least 85% of the time. Uh, right? I can't tell you the work every time. Now, every once in a while, you get something that Fox News uh, says is true, and the right bar it says is not. Now what do you do? Because they're both associated with the right. Fox News says it's true. The fine people hoax, for example, is its opinion people were saying it wasn't true, but the news people were sort of staying away from it, like maybe it was true. So you weren't quite sure if you were watching Fox News if that was true or not for a long time. But if you read Breitbart, also associated with conservative uh, viewers, it said cleanly, no, it's not true, and often Joel Pollock would be the one, and he'd show you why. He shows his work. Oh, here's the transcript. You can see it's not true. Under those cases, who do you believe? Fox, not so clear. Or Breitbart that shows you their work and says it's not true. Breitbart, right? Now, I'm not saying Breitbart always better than Fox News. I'm saying that whenever there's one that says it's not true, it doesn't matter who it is, left or right. As soon as you see one of them say it didn't happen, Now, it gets complicated when you're looking at uh, the question of did the election, was the election, uh, let's say, uh, so you've got two different networks covering it differently. What do you do? So you've got your CNN, let's say, I'll just use them as the proxy for that. You've got CNN saying the election was fine, uh, no evidence whatsoever of fraud. 
go over to Fox, and it's just a nonstop story. It's about sketchy stuff. It doesn't prove the election was fraudulent, and, and nor does Fox make that. They didn't say we found any proof. At least the, the news, the opinion people went a little bit further. But I don't think any of them, uh, well, I don't know. I won't, it doesn't matter. What the news people said is what matters. Now, if, now if they're a little bit different, well, you've got this weird story where there are two potential fake newses. One is that the election was fraudulent, or that we have evidence that it's conclusive. And that's just we don't. And the other is that we know for sure it was fraudulent. That's not true. All we know is we don't know. That's it. We know there's no uh, widespread. There's no evidence that a court has accepted that there is widespread fraud. We know that's true. But we don't know no fraud happened. That's a whole different question. So they're both uh, 